Hi, it's Jan Beta, and as you probably know, this is yet another Commodore 64 featured on this channel. Uh, as I always say, you can never have too many C64s, so um, this is a model I didn't have, and uh, James from Canada asked if I wanted to have this, and he sent it all the way from Canada to me. This is a Commodore 64C, the earlier model that still has the um, correct printing on the keys, uh, meaning that the uh, special characters are not printed on top of the keys, but on the side here, which is a way more expensive process, and Commodore changed that later in the game, but the first Commodore 64Cs they made were had this um, nicer keyboard. And it has a broken off uh, plunger here, but it comes with the key, so I can probably fix that. Um, it supposedly doesn't work, so I'm going to take a look inside and try to fix it. So, first of all, this seems to be, uh, seems to have been repaired, at least in, uh, it is sales and services, so maybe it was sold there or it was repaired there. Uh, Sesco Electronics <laughs> in East Providence. So this was, at some point it was living in the USA, it seems. It has a CA serial number, it is made in USA, it has a CA serial number, so it might be that it was produced in the, in the United States for the um, Canadian market, I don't know, I'm not quite sure about this. If you know for sure what this means, um, it was sent to me from Canada at least, so I'm just going to assume it is uh, a Canadian model. It at least it, it has to be an NTSC model um, as opposed to the European and elsewhere in the world uh, PAL models. The American Canadian models are uh, NTSC video standard. So yeah, let's open her up and, and have a look at first. And the first thing that's different, this is actually um, Torx screws. So I need to look for a Torx screwdriver. This is not um, none of my other C64s, European made C64s that I have, um, have this. Oh, so these were very loosely in there, so this probably has been has been opened before. What we're going to have a look at. Anyway. And it has all kinds of hinges in the sides and on the back, so I'm just going to carefully wiggle it a bit. There we go. Aha, okay. I'm kind of hoping I can't see right now. Uh, I'm kind of hoping this is a 250466 board, because it was the last board revision before Commodore went on to make the short boards. This is a long board. Um, so that's considered the best uh, long board revision that there is. And I kind of feel like it might be. So let's let's have a look. I'm pretty excited because this is my favorite board revision. Um, and I don't have one yet. So maybe I have one now. Let's see. Let's uh, take out the keyboard. Okay, moment of truth. Yes! It is 250466. Nice, nice. My favorite Commodore 64 bot revision. And now I have one. Excellent. <laughs> Thanks, James. Uh, although you probably didn't know that I was after one of these for quite a while. Thanks. And also, it has one of these um, golden looking PCBs that I quite like for some reason. Uh, yeah, favorite, 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 win! And uh, supposedly this doesn't work correctly, so even more wins, so we're probably going to have a nice repair video out of this. And speaking of PCBs, PCBWay kindly sponsored this video and is going to do some sponsoring for videos in the future. In the case of PCBWay, I would have recommended anyway. I used them before and they uh, deliver high quality PCBs and uh, yeah, you basically send them Gerber files, they send you back PCBs and... Uh, so the prices are very reasonable and uh, you also get a $5 voucher if you first register for this site, so don't miss out on that. There's also a link in the description, so um, check them out if you haven't done so. This has a uh, soldered on RF shield. Um, 
with which also acts as a heat sink kind of in these but it doesn't work very well so I'm probably going to get rid of this and uh, replace it with a proper heat sink first of all I have to remove the screws so I can take out the whole PCB and that's Torx screws again <laughs> Mm, beautiful. <laughs> this looks pretty amazing. Just getting rid of some dust. But I've seen way worse. <laughs> so this is pretty clean. Uh, let's have a closer look. So this is pretty interesting. These are the um, CIA chips. And one is actually a 6526A. And one is 8521ROB or R0B. Uh, 8521 is a newer version of the 6526. So it's, it's basically the same chip. These are interchangeable, I guess. I think it can run on, on higher speeds, but it doesn't have to in the Commodore 64. So these are the ROMs. Uh, I don't know which is which, of course, off the top of my head. One is the kernel ROM, one is the basic ROM, and one is the uh, character ROM. Processor 6510. So here's the SID chip. And I wiped off the um, thermal compound there for a bit, and it's a 6581R4AR. And that means uh, Revision 4 Advanced Resonance. <laughs> uh, these sound a bit peculiar. Um, they were used in early Commodore 128s and in these um, Commodore 64s with the 250466 uh, mainboard revision. Primarily, I don't know if they were used in other machines too, but these 1986 uh, machines came with this revision of the SID. Uh, that sounds a bit special. So you see the usual PLA, and the VIC-2 should be the latest revision too, I guess. So the VIC-2 also is uh, the latest NTSC revision, it's the 6567R9. So this should output pretty nice picture quality. And you can see here this little jumper, um, NTSC open, PAL short. This is an NTSC machine, because the jumper is open, obviously. <laughs> and you can convert this to a PAL system by replacing the crystal, uh, replacing the NTSC VIC-2 with a PAL VIC-2. You can spot these 250466 boards even by looking in the case from, from the back here. Uh, if the fuse is in this orientation, uh, it probably is one of the 250466 boards, because that's the only one. Uh, apart from some very old boards that have different uh, stuff going on anyway. But if you see this in one of the C64Cs, you can be quite sure that this is the 250466 board with the quirks. One other thing that this uh, board is special for is there's this large empty space where the uh, massive amount of RAM chips is in the older revisions of the board. And these are the RAM chips. So our 64K are uh, condensed into these two RAM chips. And these uh, are not as prone to failure as the old models, uh, so these are pretty pretty reliable, actual, actually. Um, they do fail, of course, RAM fails. Uh, still, still RAM fails in modern PCs. So RAM is always, it always uh, gets um, gets stressed quite a bit in systems. So, but it's it's peculiar that there's so much uh, free space. They didn't make the board smaller, but just um, consolidated the RAM chips into two. Interesting. And there's a little 556 timer <laughs> for the reset routine and stuff. So on first inspection, I can't see anything particularly bad about this thing. So uh, let's just fire it up and see what it does. Maybe it, it does work. I don't. I don't know. Maybe it is just uh, was just a bit of dust that got somewhere and uh, prevented it from from running. Let's see. Okay, it has a black screen. Let's get some voltages. So I'm mostly measuring voltages on the user port here at first because you get the uh, 5 volts DC supply voltage for the ICs there. So there's our 5 volts which are very okay. 
5.03. That's very nearly completely spot on. Let's get the voltage for the uh, 9 volts AC, which should be a bit higher with my power supply. 10.56. Okay, that's perfectly okay. So we have voltages. Let's see if the um, 12 volt comes through. Okay, let's quickly check the voltage regulators. So this should be on 5 volts. Yep, and this should be 12 volts. Yep, 12.12, perfect. So these are working. Okay, so at this point I would just uh, bring out my dead test cartridge, which I luckily have. I highly recommend getting one of these if you are troubleshooting Commodore 64s, um, because they basically work. If most of the components don't work, they still can show you if there's bad RAM and stuff. So let's get out the dead test. One thing that I just realized that I can see without the uh, dead test connected even when turning this on, it shows me this white stripe, a uh, white vertical stripe on the uh, very left margin of the screen. Um, this is a sign for the VIC-2 actually working because it produces this stripe if it's uh, working correctly. So it's probably not the VIC-2. Okay, something seems to be wrong with the cartridge port. Uh-oh! And it's pretty badly bent and cracked. Maybe that's uh, one reason why this doesn't work. Okay, so I'm probably going to take the camera out of the way for this. Um, using just, just one of these spiky tools to just try and bend it a bit back. Maybe I'm also using a screwdriver for this. Okay, the screwdriver was a better choice. I just used a, a flathead screwdriver, uh, like this, a small flathead, and uh, tried to wiggle them into place. And probably should be enough to run the dead test cartridge. I'm just going to quickly measure if there's a short between these pins or something like that. So just to be sure, I don't uh, mess this thing up more than it already was. So let's let's test that. Beep beep beep. beep. Okay, no shorts. Oh, the suspense! Let's see what it does. Okay, gives me the stripe. Does it do anything else? Yes, it does. <laughs> and the picture is very, it's uh, long for my <laughs> for my taste, because I'm used to PAL system. This is the, the, actually the first NTSC C64 I own. So, okay, this seems to at least halfway work. Let's see what it says. So, stack page seems to be okay. Screen RAM. Oh, the color RAM is bad, okay. So U21, so it hangs with U21 shown as bad, okay. Okay, turning it off again. Let's see if it can start Jupiter Lander. <laughs> That's a test that um, Commodore engineers actually did in factory. So um, Jupiter Lander bypasses the kernel ROM just as the dead test. So yeah, this seems to work. So obviously the F1 key is stuck. So the SID doesn't produce, doesn't seem to produce any sound. Maybe my setup is incorrect, but it should start up without the SID. So let's just remove that for now. So basically the same setup, I just removed the SID from the socket, um, have the dead test inserted back into the C64. Let's see, maybe it passes now. The peculiar thing is that um, there is no U21 on this board. <laughs> so, uh, it can't be bad. Let's see, maybe it just passes and the, the sit was just shorted. It got hilariously hot, uh, even for a sit. They do get warm quite a bit, but uh, not that warm.
Okay, it seems to go... Yeah. It goes further than before. So, a shorted sit can bring down a whole system, I guess. So it should now probably... Let's just wait for the test to pass, but I think this should now power up just fine. Uh, minus having sound. <laughs> so the sound test will of course fail because uh, you won't hear any sound without a sit, obviously. But otherwise it passes the test now. Um, yeah. So I suppose it was just a short sit. So let's see without the um, dead test cartridge, if it boots up or starts up to the basic screen. Okay, the big moment! Should now, if my assumptions are correct, it should now just start with the basic screen, hopefully. Yes! It does! <laughs> yeah, so this is my first uh, NTSC Commodore 64. <laughs> and the SID was bad. Interesting fault in the end, because uh, I didn't see a, a SID bring down a whole system yet. But I heard that it's possible, so it is possible. <laughs> this was a black screen just because the sit was bad. Okay, so it passes except for uh, the sit obviously showing as bad control port. Uh, I guess it is testing the uh, the um, pedal inputs, which are uh, the analog pedal inputs, which are. Uh, handled by the SID because it has analog inputs. Uh, I think that's why it shows the control port as bad. The 6526 might show as bad because it's the new 8521 on the U2 position and I think they have some problems uh, with detecting those. The timers are okay, which are handled by the CIAs. Uh, so the 6526 isn't it's 6526, so maybe that's why it's showing us it as bad, because the um, timings and stuff are a tiny bit different in those uh, chips, but it should not be a problem at all. Hmm. So, I guess I, I'm just going to put in a replacement SID for now that I'm going to salvage from somewhere and see if that works. Okay, uh, for now. I salvaged the one from this uh, black C64 that you saw me repairing in another video. Hopefully this should now work. And we have sound. <laughs> it's coming from the tiny little speakers in this monitor, so it doesn't sound amazing, but uh, at least We have sound. And now the demo crashed because it's probably not running very well on NTSC. Yeah, very nice, very nice. This machine seems to be work working flawlessly. Um, let's fix the keyboard, I guess, and then we have a fixed Commodore 64. Okay, the machine itself is working beautifully. Uh, let's take care of the missing key. Yeah, this operation brings this back into play, which is my uh, Commodore 64C that I salvaged stuff from. Uh, and I have this keyboard, which I already took apart. There's a lot of screws uh, normally took out all the screws already, so I just have two or three to remove to get this off and then be able to um, remove the plunger, take all the screws on this one off, <laughs> which of course has them all, and uh, replace the plunger with one of those. The one that is broken is broken off here. Could try gluing it back together, but I have a spare keyboard, so I'm just going to use that. Let's go! And to be able to remove this brown thing, uh, we also have to remove these two 
solo joints here. Oh, we have to de-solo them. So that's what I'm going to do. Um, this is the shift lock key from the back side. So we have to remove these two. And then the board should come off and we have uh, access to the contacts and to the little plungers. There we go. There's the circuit board. We can clean the contacts a bit. Oh. And there's the plungers. <laughs> and we can take off, we should be able to take this one out, which is the F1 one. And replace it with the one we just extracted. <laughs> it should be the same. There are a couple of different uh, revisions of these key stems, but these are compatible, as far as I can see. So I'm not going to clean the keyboard in full in this episode. Probably there's going to be a refurb and future-proofing episode about this thing at some point. For now I'm just going to place the key back on there after I... Uh, put the circuit board back in and clean it a bit. Now for cleaning the circuit board I'm just going to use some uh, of my usual contact cleaner and just spray it lightly over there and spread it with a cloth making sure to not rub off any of the carbon. It's, a, it's like a lacquer um, with carbon in it that the contacts are on this side so you can see that some of it is pretty black I'm just going it going over it very lightly so I don't uh, damage anything and this usually is enough let's put this back on and then see if we can fit the um, keycap on it more screws back on. Oh, we have to extract the rest of the uh, plunger that's in here. So I'm just going to try and... Ah, there we go. Just came out. Um, if it's stuck in there, you can use like a screw and screw it in there halfway. And then just pull it out. Yeah, this seems to have worked nicely. Let's see if the keyboard still works. Okay, keyboard does work. Nice. So, putting back in the rest of the screws. And for this uh, repair portion of the video, I'm just going to put it back together. Because it now is a fully working Commodore 64 with the 250466 board that I was looking for for quite a while. And I'm probably going to do more work on this and refurb it fully. The keyboard could, could use clean from the outside. Uh, and the chips need some heat sinks, I guess. The capacitors could be replaced and my usual future proofing could be done. I'm also going to consider maybe making this uh, a PAL machine because the PAL machines are a lot more compatible with stuff. Uh, there's a lot more software that runs on PAL uh, than there is software for NTSC. There are a lot of games for NTSC too and, and things like that, but uh, mostly stuff that runs was made for NTSC also runs on PAL, but not the other way around. So there's more PAL software so you're better off having a PAL C64, basically. I uh, hope this was informative and entertaining. So if you did like this, please consider subscribing to this channel. 
there's more to come, more 64 stuff is always going to come, more retro computing stuff of all kinds. If you are considering making more of these videos possible, please consider checking out my Patreon and uh, maybe become a supporter of this channel. So, uh, so much for now. Thanks for watching. I'm Ian Peter. See you next time. Bye.